good evening and welcome to the Natural History Institute. We really appreciate you coming to the artist talk. Um, it'll be almost two years, two years in February since we had a gathering in this space. So this is really energizing and exciting for us. And it's just happy. I'm happy to see so many familiar faces and to have people back in here. Um, I encourage you to keep your mask on and ob observe social distancing to, uh, for the protection of one another. Even when we're in the, we're in the gallery space, that's, that's going to be important. The thing to know is that this building has an ultraviolet air purification system, and so the air is, that is being circulated is being purified as it's circulated, so that um, might make us a little bit more comfortable. And before I introduce tonight's speaker, I want to make you aware of a few upcoming events here at the Natural History Institute. Tomorrow, the gallery will be open from 5 to 7.30 for Fourth Friday Art Walk. And so after you hear the talk tonight and having seen the exhibition, I'm sure you're going to want to go back home and tell your friends about it and then bring them out tomorrow night from 5 to 7.30 during the Fourth Friday Art Walk. Another event is Sean's uh, field experience, the artist workshop. That's happening this Sunday from 9 to 1. And there's spaces still available in that workshop. And so if you're interested in, in joining that workshop, talk to Jesse Rack, our program director right there. <laughs> And then, finally, I want to make you all aware of our fall fundraising campaign. This is a fantastic opportunity for you to support us in spreading our, in, in, in our mission. That is just spreading the practice of natural history. And it's uh, incredible and fantastic because we have a, a donor who's willing to match whatever is uh, donated. So if you haven't donated, here's a great opportunity for you to really make a big difference for us. And if you have donated, we really appreciate it. Um, as a matter of fact, you can donate online or you can donate here tonight. Um, if you want to donate here tonight, we have Deb Ford. She's our development director. Raise your hand there, Deb. She's right there in the back of the room. That's the person. He, you want to see, and uh, she'll help you out with that. So the practice of natural history relies on some fundamental characteristics, such as attentiveness, receptivity, honesty, and accuracy. Our speaker tonight, Sean Scabelin, his artistry relies on each one of those characteristics. You'll feel in his work what happens when a person opens themselves up to a biological community over a long period of time, once open to a place, the place can change you, speak through you. So tonight, we're presented with a wonderful opportunity to understand how a place speaks through an artist. Sean is a Flagstaff-based artist with, an M with a BFA, MA, and MFA in drawing and painting. He served as an artist in residence in many places stretching from Alaska to Kansas and has been involved in numerous one-person and collaborative exhibitions. We feel fortunate to host Sean's work here. And with that, welcome, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, I haven't done this for a while, so now <laughs> feels good to be back. Uh, I've got a lot of work to show you, but I ha it's hard narrowing it down when you've done this for so long. But <clears throat> this reminds me of when I gave a lecture up in Fairbanks. 
And we sat in the bar, <laughs> and people were staggered around each table. <laughs> it was great. So, um, what I thought I'd do, I, I want to show you a few drawings that I did or have done. And then we're going to move to installations, because that's what I've been doing for 30 years. Uh, but I have three degrees in drawing, as Bob mentioned. And yes, I still draw. And it's still my love. Um, this first image, and if since the lights are still on, this is great. I can, can you guys can see this, these images pretty good. So if you do have questions, feel free to um, raise your hand or heckle. <laughs> Deborah, you get two heckles. <laughs> um, because sometimes you want to really know something right then and there, so. This is a drawing I did as an undergraduate at Utah State University. Um, and this is probably the drawing that started my career in the themes of my work up till now. Um, it was an actual experience. My brother and I were driving back to, to campus up Sardine Canyon, and we came upon this deer that had just been hit by a car. And uh, it was still standing in the middle of the road. And we just pulled up and shined the headlights on it and just watched it take its last breaths. Um, and then it collapsed. And, and two weeks later, I did this charcoal drawing. It's called Roadkill Number One. <clears throat> As a student at Utah State, I was really enjoyed the work of the German artist Franz Mark. And this is called Animal Fate, or Fate of the Animals. Uh oh. What happened? Nothing. <laughs> OK. Um, so the middle deer is Franz Mark was part of the Blue Rider movement. And blue, uh, the color blue was actually a symbol of hope for that group. And uh, then I decided to take and draw that deer again. This is actually the. Drawings, that, this one's about the same size. It's done in charcoal, conti crayon, and black shoe polish. And then this is a small, tiny little Franz Mark watercolor. And I decided I had come upon this deer in the same form or shape as the Franz Mark piece. And I decided to do a drawing of it with my shadow over the top of it. I went to, uh, moved on to the University of Iowa for grad school. And uh, my second year there, I started doing these large drawings, um, approximately three feet by five feet. And I'm showing you this one because it was a pivotal piece in the career, in my career, where I actually did the drawing and then just wanted to do something more with it. So I found some honey locust thorns and cut the branches off and tied them together and hung them in front of the drawing. So that piece was very pivotal for me, as was this one. Again, my second year there, 
trying to figure out at this time how I could create a drawing without using my hands. So I took a map of the United States, adhered it to a sheet of uh, drawing paper, and then set it in front of the studio door. And for the duration of the semester, I would walk across this map. And then I took, at the end, and drew a heart line arrow. And so the, the act of walking into my studio each day became a symbolic act of manifest destiny. <clears throat> Not sure what's going on, but... My <laughs> the person you see there is, I discovered the work. No, that's not working. That is Joseph Boyce. Anyone heard of Joseph Boyce? the German artist, father of the Green Movement of Germany. I discovered his work in um, grad school and, and just fell in love with it. And I realized, wow, this is what an artist can do. I don't have to draw anymore. Um, and this was a performance action piece that he did where he lived with, it was called America Loves, Why I Like America, Why America Likes Me or something like that. Where he flew into, and part of the performance was getting on a plane, flying from Dusseldorf to New York City, take, getting off the plane, being put on an ambulance, and taken to the gallery, and then taken and moving into the gallery and living with a live coyote for four days without food and water, and relying on that animal. Um, and I have a whole bunch of images of that, but those went out the window. But that performance, more than any Artwork had a dramatic effect on, on my career. Um, after graduate school, I went to the, lived near the Canadian border in the state of Washington to take care of a studio for one of my professors from grad school. I was there for about 10 months. And one morning in the winter, I s looked out the window and saw that shape in the field across the highway and recognized that shape, knew what it was, and walked out into the field We, you know what we could do? <laughs> we could just put the computer on. <laughs> no. <laughs> and it won't pop up. But it might pop up. But I saw that shape and I said, wow, I never recognized that shape. I walked out in the field. And it was, that shape turned into a form, and that form was a coyote. Um, a man? <laughs> I'll just keep talking. And then I took that coyote, I buried a, uh, built a burial scaffold on the mountain behind the house I was living in, 
and I carried the coyote and laid it on top of the scaffold and let it disintegrate, um, break down till it was turned itself into a, a skeleton. And then a few months later, here we go, let's try. There's the coyote. Nope, it had been shot. My neighbor who lived about a half mile, quarter mile up the road, up the highway, had shot it because when I saw the coyote and the, um, the blood, I decided to follow the drips of the blood back to where it had been shot, which was about a quarter mile. And for some reason, I said, wow, it died where I could see it. So I, that's why I built the scaffold. And then a year or a few months later, no, it was actually a year later, I drove from Michigan back to Washington just so that I could collect the bones of the coyote. And you'll see the skeleton later on. There's the scaffold. Well, in um, Washington, I uh, was invited a year later to come back and do my first installation. Um, I call myself a site-specific, place-based artist, installation artist, because I not only um, design installations that are specific to the place, meaning specific to the gallery where they're going into, but also the theme of the work is specific to that place. So this is the art gallery at Whitworth College. I had never really, I mean, I dabbled with maybe one installation as a grad student, done some sculptural work, but I thought, well, I need to really test this out, and luckily the gallery director said, yeah, why don't you experiment in this, in this space? Coming from a drawing background, I decided, well, how do I do this? And my first inclination was, well, don't draw this thing out on paper. Just draw this out in your head and draw it out on the floor, and that be is your drawing. And then from there, the three-dimensional elements will come out of that. So what you see is wanting to work with this space. I created a plywood trough that is the length of the gallery, which was 20 feet long. And, and then the width of that trough was the same with as those two circular air, air ducts that you see. Then my drawing, instead of drawing with charcoal and with my hand, I then decided, well, I'll create the Columbia River and router it out into the plywood. And that's what you see there, meandering the full length of the gallery. I then had collected some uh, pine pitch, lodgepole pine pitch, melted it down, and the charcoal, the pine pitch became the charcoal, and I poured that melted pine pitch into that routered line. I had hired a small-time logger to, he was doing a thinning, 
and this is him. And he had taken the logs. I needed the bark stripped off of them, so he had taken them to the Spokane Indian Reservation sawmill, and they stripped the logs off for me, or the bark off the logs for me. We loaded on the truck. And this is the first log set into the piece. And you can see how I've moved all the lights from the right hand to the left because I wanted the source to be from the back. Uh oh, there we go. And then what I did was create two walls of logs, one on either side of this. And then this is the finished piece as you enter into the space into the gallery. The installation was ca called A Line Issued Out of the Ground. And it was a, the theme of the work was about the extinction or the near extinction of the Chinook salmon that had been decimated since the building of the dams on the Col Columbia River. <clears throat> So this is standing as if you're looking down at the piece in the middle of it. And then before setting in that last log, I'd photograph this looking west. No, it would be looking eastward. And then turning the tripod around and photographing this shot of two full Chinook salmon symbolically swimming up the river. And these, these are approximately 33 feet long, which is quite big. I'd w uh, at this time, I was living in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'd worked, they have a huge fish collection of over a million fish. And these, a graduate student was doing genetic research on these, and he had them, five or six of them, frozen. And uh, so I worked with the fish curator and together we uh, parboiled them, took the meat off of them, and then put them in the bug room and let the bugs clean them up. And then at the end of the several weeks after that, I then re-articulated the skeleton. <coughs> And these are actual Chinook salmon, as I said, that were caught in the Great Lakes, but originated in the Pacific. And then you can see the shadow of the fish with the curve of the river. <clears throat> um, I thought, wow, it's a beautiful piece. Maybe I should do this seriously. <laughs> um, there's no money in it, but heck. There's, why not become a starving artist? Uh, it's easier to sell drawings and, and do large scale installation, but the piece turned out so beautiful that I thought, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really do this. Um, when we, my wife and I, before moving to Ann Arbor and leaving Iowa City, our landlord asked us to clean up the compost from our garden. Um, and I wasn't very happy about doing that, but it was a blessing. I came at the bottom of the compost, I came upon these beautiful objects that I said, wow, these are very sculptural. 
these are, I, and then uh, it, it took me a while to figure out what they were, but they were broccoli stalks that I'd thrown in the bottom of the compost. I know it sat there over winter, and I thought, wow, these are so beautiful. Maybe I'll design an installation. So I drew out an installation, wrote up a proposal, and sent it off to a gallery. And uh, darn it, they accepted the piece, which means meant I had to go to work. Um, and I had to rent a plot from the city of Ann Arbor. And you could rent garden plots, and I grew 900 broccoli plants. <laughs> and this is the morning that we're about to harvest them. Now, broccoli is commercially grown in Michigan. It lo it's a cold weather plant. It loves cold, gray, Great Lakes area weather. But that summer, we had a very hot, dry summer, which was a blessing for the, the broccoli gods were looking on, down on me. Because I wanted a plant that was tall without a head on it. And there's a perfect specimen for an artist, not for eating. <laughs> And it, I wanted to preserve the roots. So we soaked the ground so that we could gently pull the, the, the stalk and the roots out. And then my installation called for about 250 stalks. So I went and selected the, the winners and laid them out on the ground, took the leaves off of them, and then at this point, I was trying to recreate what Mother Nature had done that I had noticed in the compost, that these beautiful white bone-like objects or stalks with the roots on, there was something that nature had caused that to do. And I figured it had to do with freezing. So I took these stalks and rented a, a big deep freezer, and I froze them for a month. And then I thought, well, there was something else nature had done, and, and that was the drying of them. So then I created this, this clothesline type thing and I spread them out and hung them out to dry. Once again, the broccoli gods were with me. We didn't have a normal wet fall or autumn. It was very warm, dry, perfect for drying. So basically what I was doing is preserving them through freeze drying. I then took a pocket knife and scraped the green layer off because I knew that there was a woody structure underneath. And then I was able to get my perfect form that I wanted. I then installed this at Cornell College in Iowa, and the, the ga art gallery is this, just this big wooden beautiful wooden floor that's about, oh, probably 45 feet by 30 feet. So I recreated this installation, which you'll see, but the first iteration of it was just a big rectangle that was 15 feet by 35 feet, or thereabouts. I show you the second iteration of it because it, for me, is a lot stronger. And this was part of a group show, and because the piece was so big, they 
had a hard time finding a space for it, a place for it. And they finally said, why don't you do your piece in the lobby of the Marriott Hotel on the Michigan State campus? So this is, and I love the, the piece because I, I walked in that morning thinking I was going to set up a rectangular piece. And I said, no, it won't work because of all the geometric stuff that's going on. And more importantly, what you don't see is underneath that installation, that geometric installation there, is a floral pattern on the carpet that was so distractive that a rectangle would sit on that and it wouldn't work. So for the next two hours, I, because I was ready to install my work, but they didn't tell me what this, what this space looked like. So I sat there and just redesigned the whole piece and got rid of all the floral pattern by covering the whole thing up in the same shape as what you see. So what you see is a, a geometric shape going this way and that that is approximately 25 feet by 30 feet. And the light yellow is about two tons of organic cornmeal. And the, so these are aerial views from above. And then there's about 255 broccoli stalks that are embedded in the cornmeal. So what you see is this European old world plant broccoli being embedded in this, the soils, the native soils symbolized by the the cornmeal. So this was a piece that talked about the industrial farming that goes on in the Midwest and, and the loss of indigenous and indigenous plants, animals, cultures because of how we European Americans settled the Midwest. It's called a New World Burial. And then at the far end, embedded in the circle, is that coyote that I had traveled, which symbolizes the, the indigenous cultures that have been pushed aside and marginalized. So that piece was done in around 1996. Um, that same year I was uh, no, I take that back. That piece was done in 19, originally 1994. The, the iteration was 96. That's right. And then that spring, I was getting my beds ready, digging them down so that I could put the compost in. And I thought, wow, I really want to do something here. So I walked in the house and told my wife to take all her clothes off and come lay in one of my beds. And she was eight months, three weeks pregnant. So this is called Mother Earth, or Adrian, who was given birth a week later, Adrian's first home. And then about three months later, I did this small installation. Um, my brother had come upon a roadkill deer, um, pregnant deer and it had aborted, it had been hit by a truck and aborted its 
eat us. And he picked up, he happened to be riding his bike up that canyon and he picked it up and said, wow, I know who can use this. <laughs> so he packed it in dry ice and shipped it off to me and, and I created this small installation. And it's called Picnic at the Footstool. Um, in preparation for, I do a lot of, whenever I do a installation, I like to schedule them at least a minimum of two years in advance, preferably three, because I spend at least the first year and year and a half doing the research of of the work I'll be doing and during that research well, I came upon this photograph uh, which you probably all seen this is a a mountain of bison skulls it's outside the Detroit carbon works and I thought, wow, someday I'd like to do an installation that explores this whole issue of the slaughter of the bison on the Great Plains. So I did a kinetic sculpture or installation, uh, 18 feet by 18 feet with this steel carousel that I fabricated and, um, and the carousel is seven feet tall and it slowly just drags these bison skulls and allows them to plow into this bed of cornmeal and there's about uh, again two tons or two thousand pounds one ton of cornmeal so it's about four, four inches deep. So when the, the bison were pretty much exterminated, slaughtered, someone realized, oh, there's money, there's profit to be made. And so all those bones that they collected and they were shipped on trains in either Detroit, Philadelphia, St. Louis, or Baltimore. And they were then processed, those bones were processed into carbon and made into fertilizer. And then that fertilizer was then taken back to the Great Plains for European, Ameri European Americans who were farming. So the, there was this circle going on. Um, in 2021, I do believe, I was invited to go to University of Alaska up in Anchorage and install an installation. Um, it was on the 10th anniversary of the Exxon Valdez spill. And I wanted to create an installation using uh, materials that were pertinent to to the pipeline, the 700 mile pipeline from the North Slope to Valdez. And in order to protect the permafrost, they insulated because the basically the oil comes straight from the ground and is shipped in those pipes for 700 miles. They have to, and is over 200 degrees when it comes out of the ground, they have to protect the permafrost. And the, the insulating material they use is river gravel. And so the base of this installation, which the, the title of this installation is called Land of Exploitation, is six inches deep of river gravel. <clears throat> And this is, is about six feet wide and 35 feet long.
So you can see the four circular basins embedded in the, in the gravel, and those are filled with oil. And then at the far end, I created this totem using a, a Sitka spruce timber. And then the animals indigenous to Alaska with the beluga whale at the top. And then at the bottom, a salmon skull. And then that oil from the first basin, the oil would flow down that timber and pour into that first basin and then would recirculate and you can see the little hole where the oil flows out. And then symbolically, these are animal bladders um, actually, just from up the road from Chino Valley, cow animal bladders. Originally, I was wanted to use caribou bladders, and I was working with the the uh, caribou um, commission up in Alaska, and had asked them if when they round up their reindeer or their caribou, they would save four of the bladders for me, and they said no problem, but it is winter, and we're not gathering up our reindeer, herding our reindeer, and it would be a, a big problem. Um, so, so I was forced to, to figure out what could I use, and luckily I discovered the, the small slaughterhouse, I don't know if it's still, still up there, in Chino Valley, and they were able to get me four cow bladders. Um, and those are filled with oil, and those just symbolically drip into the basins. I think uh, we'll cover, well, again, uh, any questions? Okay. We'll, we'll try and get, this is uh, 2000, well, the image is from the 1950s. Um, but when we, my wife and I moved our family to Flagstaff from Ann Arbor, one of the, one of the first things we did obviously was go to the Grand Canyon. And uh, we ended up going that year for, set, I think, seven times. <laughs> and one of our hikes, we did the West Rim Trail. And as we were hiking the trail, we came upon this fence blocking our, our way. And it was a um, chain link fence. And I thought, what is happening here? And it said, do not enter, dangerous. And I said, hmm, I got to figure out what's going on here. And this was in 1998. So in 2011, there was a call for entries or participants to be invited to do an artist in residency at the Grand Canyon. And I thought, well, I've always wanted to know what was going on. And in the meantime, in those 12 preceding years, I learned that, that the Park Service had allowed uranium mining to happen. And I couldn't understand why, why a national park would allow uranium mining inside the canyon, inside the park. Not just in the canyon, but in the park itself. And so I wrote up a proposal to see if I could be an artist in residence and investigate, explore, and find out the reason why this was allowed. 
and lo and behold, they accepted my proposal. Um, this is the artist's apartment, second floor of the Burr Camp's visitor center. And this was my view every morning and night for three weeks. Um, I was allowed to go into the park archives and look at the original documents, the contracts, letters, and um, and then allowed to photograph all their images. And this is what the camp or the mine actually looked like, the Aryan Nina mine right there on the rim. This is some of the ore being put into the dump truck. And then this is the 1950s photo. And then somewhere similar, this is a photo I took of that site, that, what it looked like in 2012 when I was a resident. Or 2011 when I was a resident. cleaned up all the shacks, all the buildings, all the infrastructure, covered it. With plastic and sandbags so that it wouldn't blow. That's actually the glory hole of the, the mine, the Orpheum, or the orphan mine looking from Hopi Point. And then um, part of the agreement, and this is how I usually do my, my residencies, is I will ask them if I can come out for the first part of the residency and do the research I need to do, and then return and do an installation. Um, and luckily they said yes, and we went from building to building, figure out a good space where the installation might be, and they decided that the park headquarters, the lobby of the park headquarters would be the best one. And they were on pins and needles constantly, the administration, because they were, I was the first political conceptual artists they had ever invited. And they were worried what I might do. Um, in fact, the opening of the installation, the park superintendent was supposed to introduce me. Um, and they got, the public affairs officer got word that he was coming and she told him, you will not be allowed to go to this opening um, because of the politics involved. So I was, at this time, this was 2011. I was a resident there in May. We were headed off to Italy um, to live for four months for my wife's job, teaching a class. And I spent time in Italy figuring out what I would, or drawing out the design of my installation. And I wanted a material that I could use that would symbolize uranium or yellow cake. And um, it was sometime in mid-November that I, I w walked out of our apartment door in Siena, Italy, 
and there was these pine, pine cones scattered all over the ground with yellow pollen that had spilled out of the cone when it hit the ground. And I said, wow, that's my material. That's my natural material. Now, how am I going to get enough? Um, make a long story short, I collected thousands of these from the five trees of outside of our apartment. For some reason, I don't know this pine well enough, but they shed, unlike the cones we have in Flagstaff and around here, you get pollen in the first two weeks of June in Flagstaff. This was November and the pollen cones are falling. Um, maybe the pollen gods were working. <laughs> so I collected the thousands of these and figured out, okay, now I need the pollen, and I got a gallon of pollen. And then I experimented, I took my yoga mat and covered it with pollen, and it was so beautiful that I said, okay, this is going to work. But the problem was my show was in May. To install, I had to start installing the show at the Grand Canyon in May. Pollen doesn't arrive till June, so now what am I going to do? So I said, okay, I'm going to chance it. I'm going to take that pollen and bring it home. <laughs> and I didn't want to have it confiscated at the airport when I entered the United States. So I didn't declare it. <laughs> we put it in Ziploc bags, packed it between clothes, <laughs> and luckily they didn't they weren't able to scan it in their X-ray machine. So, but that's what ponderosa pine cones look like. Pollen cones look like. They're much smaller, and so that's what I do every June now: is go out and collect pollen cones. As you walk into the lobby. You would see this map. I don't know if it's still there. I haven't been there for a few years. But there's this map, vinyl map, adhered to the flagstone floor. There's these seven or eight photographs that you walk across. You can see the river. You can see these, these uh, banners that hang down. So I decided, well, I will recreate that map using ponderosa pine lumber. And wherever there is a photograph, I'll create a window. So I created this abstract map. And then the windows were covered with these concrete sandstone cast things, that plates covering those windows so that you couldn't see these springs or these riparian places within the Grand Canyon. And then you can see there's, again, I using I drew a line with my router and recreated the Colorado River. And this piece, this installation is called the price of entrance. The banners were replaced with muslin banners. And then the two pipes that you see 
or ceramic pipes. And they come from the old sewer line from Grand Canyon Village. And part of my, as a resident, I, had, I would just wander around that area. And I came upon this, wondered what it was. And it was the old sewer line. And uh, I actually took the park archaeologist out there. And she didn't even know this, this thing existed. And she allowed me to take two of those pipes and use them in my work. And so what you see is the two pipes are the actual mines that exist today. The South Canyon mine is the one closest to us. And the one that was inactive at that time, the Denison mine on the North Rim, um, is where they are situated on this abstract map. And then you can see the pine pollen. Again, the banners were replaced with sheets of muslin that I'd sewn and then embedded a cottonwood leaf inside them. And then a detail. I think we've seen enough work, but I can show more. I've done about 80 of these things, so <laughs> you only get to see about six of them. <laughs> It's up to you guys. I only got about 12 more slot images, so. OK. This is a piece, I, or an installation, a big show I did at the Coconino Center for the Arts um, in 2013. First show I'd done in Flagstaff after living there for 15 years. For some reason, people would get scared of showing my work. Um, I had sh five previous shows that were always pulled out at the last minute. Uh, even though the work is beautiful, it's quite political. This piece you will recognize. It's in the gallery, collaborating with an Aber. And then the, People have asked about the pine needle piece that's in the gallery. That's the very first one that I did. It's eight feet in diameter. About 40 bags, 40 bags of pine needles, freestanding. A vortex piece. Um, about 15, no, 13 feet tall, 16 feet wide with a crow specimen symbolically flying inside the piece. And then the base is a steel anchor with a plate of of pine pollen on it. A piece about fire. This is about 19 feet in diameter with hundreds of charred timbers that I collected from old burns. And then I was allowed to use the, uh, the sewer pipes again.
with an aspen pole that comes out symbolically, symbolizing smoke rising, curling up. Oh, I think I have more than I thought. <laughs> I was invited to do create an installation where a concert pianist could perform inside the installation. And the viewer, and to create it so that the viewer could actually not only walk through the installation, but also listen to the concert. So this was on the NAU campus. And that's the pianist playing, my collaborator. And then rising out of that, you can, it's hard to see from these images, but there's a, another vortex using fishing line or filament and it's anchored a bit we we built a anchor that surrounded the grand piano and then the lines came out of that and went to the ceiling and then i worked with the um the burke museum up in seattle with their collection and they loaned me five crow specimens that symbolically cattled, as they call it, or flew around the top of the vortex. And then there's some, some images of the, we had, I do believe, four or five concerts And the whole piece was about fire and what it is doing to the across the globe. This is a view from above. <clears throat> and then just to give you a quick idea of the pineals. This is a piece I did last year at the Tree Ring Museum at the University of Arizona. I should say the Tree Ring Laboratory, where I took the, they had this, I don't know if you've been there, it's a beautiful, beautiful laboratory building. And it's circular, and half of it, or at least a third of it, is full windows. And so I took the pine needles and created this wall that is 40 feet long and seven feet tall. And that's uh, about a foot deep, 12 inches deep of pine needles. And then the charred timbers that you see here are also in the gallery. And then we'll finalize this one. This was, again, last year. Um, most of you have seen this, or some of you have seen this. This is a, a uh, circular basin, 22 feet in diameter, full of cattail down. And then at the axis is a cottonwood leaf that just sits and twirls and spins. Okay, I think that will do. <laughs> Yeah, if there's any, or we can go in the gallery and you can ask them more. Yeah, whatever. If anyone has questions. Sean, what years were you at Logan? 
Utah State from 1982 to 87. So this piece was, I always wanted to do a piece that that uh, looked at the, the artificial snow making on Snowball, on the sacred peaks to, to indigenous cultures. And I wanted material that would symbolize snow and cattail down is, when you see this, it's almost near perfect. It's a little brown, but not. And it, but the way it just comes down, and we had D. Lisa Miles perform in it. I, w I set it up first and then let her perform it. We did the video performance piece, and then I reinstalled it again with new cattail down, basically, because when you deal with this stuff, it presses and congeals and you got to have it. And this is thousands and thousands of cattail heads. I did a piece 20 some years ago in Chicago with cattail down, so I knew it worked. But I didn't know it would just keep, it's so light that you think it's just going to build up but it's just like snow, it just presses down. And it kept pressing down. And pretty soon I ran out of cattail down. And, and so I wanted 12 inches deep. It ended up being about eight or nine inches deep. And that's why when I say my work is political, it's not the work, the work is beautiful. It's my artist statement that I write and make people think about what we're doing to those places. And that's what be, is political, and that's why they wouldn't let the superintendent, David Umbaraga, come to my, because who pays for Grand Canyon? It's Congress, and if they say this, and this artist is hanging out with this guy who's exploring the history of uranium mining, and this is a big issue. Congress is going to pull the money away, so. I found out that it was because, basically because the Park Service and the federal government at the time were not willing to pay $45,000 to buy the mine before it became mined. They just, and then when it, there's a whole history there, but it was called apathy. Not willing to do the right thing. And so they allowed this mine that was pretty much, and that's why they allowed it to go horizontal into Park Service land. It was vertical, and they were, they allowed the mine company to go horizontal, so. And all of a sudden, it's now in the National Park. Even though the mine is surrounded National Park, it was a private inholding that they couldn't do anything about. And if they would have just stepped up to the plate at the beginning, and at that time, it was not the Park Service, it was probably the Forest Service who said, OK, let's just buy this thing for 40, this plot. And they didn't. And then a few years later, it, several years later, they mined it. So, and little do people know that the road up there, the parking lots, everything is got old uranium tailings that they crushed and brought. And <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not a, it's the safest place to be, even though. I, there's a lot you learn that you're, you're supposed to just keep quiet about. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll open the gallery. Let's make Sean. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome to go into the gallery space. Uh, I was just want to give a special thank you to Rob Goldman, the editor and the technical side of things, the government. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out, and we look forward to doing some other things.
with you. There are spaces available in the drawing workshop that Sean will be interested in. We have a couple of scholarships available in the folks who don't have the wherewithal. Thanks. Coming out again. Thank you. <laughs>